Welcome to Module 5 for EMVS 254. I'm going to be covering microwave remote sensing in this module. And to be totally honest, this is I, I love microwaves. This is my passion. And so I'm excited to be able to introduce this to you. So this is a high, very highly skilled type of remote sensing. There's a lot of different aspects to it, including signal processing and um, and image processing. So we have to kind of combine the two. So it's not something that you're going to see like a, as a regular type of map, but it's for very particular pur purposes. So the learning outcome for this module is to defend the importance of sensors operating in the microwave electromagnetic spectrum and their value to environmental and resource disciplines. So the first objective is to identify two distinctive features that characterize microwave energy from a remote sensing standpoint. Uh, I thought this was an interesting thing from the course outline because I don't get to control that. And I thought that two distinctive features, and there's, they make it sound like there's only two distinctive features that characterize microwave energy. And I don't know, I, I thought that I should approach this in a little bit of a different way. So. The first one being like, what kind of sensors are there? And, and that's the same for regular remote sensing and not. But I want to talk a little bit about those. Then we talk about the, I'll be talking about the microwave wavelengths. And then I'll talk, into, talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages. So as an introduction, just kind of thinking back, we have two different kinds of major categories of sensors. One's an active, the other's a passive. So the active sensor itself, it sends and receives signals. So this is something that has to have some energy to produce a signal or energy to be able to send out and receive back. Active sensors are used often for imaging and graphing. In particular, in microwaves, we use it for imaging and graphing. Um, and maybe not so much as graphing, for example, um, in optical, but we would use for use a spectral signature would be an example of graphing um, in the optical spectrum. So a really good example of an active sensor is radar, so which is radio detection and ranging. That's what it stands for. But it also radar is not just the police standing on the side of the the road taking checking and see if you are speeding. Uh, radar can also be used as a, a, a as an imaging system. And that's what we use from satellites and airborne systems. And, the, and actually terrestrial as well. And even in my case, biomedical. <laughs> Although um, I don't deal with the radar component of it now. But anyways, passive sensors, um, they only receive energy. So microwave sensors that are passive, it's often referred to as a thermal, um, microwave thermal imaging. Uh, just because it acts in such in such the same way. So there's natural emissions that come out of the earth and they, they come up and they go to the sensor and then we create graphs. You can make some images with it, but because the energy is so low energy and then it's like very slow, big wavelengths, it, it, it's not like high amplitude, it makes more sense to create graphs with it and try to get data from that. So here's a list of the microwave bands that we can use. So, you know, KA, K, KA and K are close range graphing. They, they don't, um, we don't use them for imaging because they're just too short of a wavelength for us. KU, and we can use in terrestrial laser scanning. I think they have some in airborne as well. And what, what KU does is as soon as the density of an object changes, it's going to scatter, but it's also going to transmit through because microwaves can transmit right through denser medium. So for example, I used to, I looked at ice and snow on ice. So the KU band would actually scatter off the different layers within the snowpack and it would show that different change in density. The X band does the same. So it has a, the density component, which the, scatters off of those changes in density, but it also looks at different properties. Like, so I could look at how things, how the energy actually bounces around within the density itself. Now C band is kind of the universal band. It's used for everything. So we can look, use C band to look at what's going on within the snowpack. We can look at, C, we can use C band to look at crops. There, 
it's kind of the normal one that everyone kind of refers to as soon as we talk about microwaves, especially from satellites, because it's not a short wavelength. But there is Terrasar X. So Terrasar X is on, um, it's up in space, and that's where the X-band comes in. S-band is what we use in our microwave, microwaves that we cook food in. Um, you can make images with S-band as well. It's not as common, but it's, it is available to us. Then L-band and P-band are the long wavelengths, and these are really great for creating surface models, and especially L-band, and because it can penetrate the tree canopy, and so it can get down to the larger trunks of trees. So in forestry, we can use L-band to be able to see where's that, that tree trunk, and I, then we can count how many trees are in the region. Or, and then P-band, for example, it is even longer of a wavelength, and it sees through pretty much everything. So it's great for creating bare earth models. So we can just see only the ground, and that's all we're going to see. We won't see trees on top. We won't see anything else. So kind of going back to these you know, features that we need to identify, like what really separates microwaves? Well, one of the big things is accuracy. So in the X and Y direction, it has a very coarse spec uh, spatial resolution. But when we're looking at vertical accuracy, they're actually quite accurate. Um, if you apply a post-processing technique called interferometry, which is where I'm taking the phase of the signals and I'm comparing those and taking differences, I'm taking fractions of a wavelength in order to determine the height of the uh, of whatever object I'm looking at. So you can't get the same accuracy from space with an optical image. Um, there's also a lot of information in the wavelengths. So optical images look at one value, so we look at how much energy has come for that band. With microwave images, because we use antennas to be able to send out and receive the data, the antenna itself um, has a lot of information when it receives it. So we have real numbers and imaginary numbers if you want to get into the math. Um, and it, so it has, it has magnitudes and phases. So that additional information adds an extra layer to the microwaves so that we can actually extract information. The biggest thing about this one is that it sees through clouds and it is all weather. So for example, in the Arctic, during the summertime, it is cloudy because the, the, all the water coming off of the off of the ocean. So if we're trying to see anything in the water up there. We need something that can penetrate through clouds, and we know that optical, um, near infrared, and visible light in particular, they don't penetrate through clouds very well. So microwaves will do that for us, so we can actually see what's below, and it is all weather. So the when we get we can have a cyclone or anything like that. We can usually see through it. Now, then you ask, well, what about the weather radar? Yes, that's still using the same technology, just different processing techniques. So we can actually identify the type of weather that we're going to be having or what's coming along our way. So that is really key. Um, if you look, for example, at, at Venezuela, they have a lot of clouds, so they tend to, or even... Um, even like Colombia, they have lots of cloud. So because of all the clouds, they need a different way to do remote sensing. So they bring in the, the microwave system so they can do that. So that's really key for this. Um, another thing is that it works all day. So because it's an active sensor, it will work all day for us, we, day or night. We don't need the sunlight to do any of that. We can do classifications, we can also do 2 and 3D mapping with it. So very powerful tool. Some of the disadvantages that kind of sets it apart is that it's a very complex and, and that processing can be very expensive. Trying to get your hands on a good processing software is very, very expensive for this for microwaves um, and in, in remote sensing compared to the other softwares. It is very large data sets, so you end up using a lot of computer memory and you need a really good computer to be able to process it because there's so much data there. You also need to have a special skill set. I've, I've talked to alumni who've come through and they contact me and they're like, yeah, I'm working for this company and we do remote sensing, but the, the people who do microwave remote sensing, most of them have PhDs. So, <laughs> so it is a very special skill set to be able to work with microwaves.
and it is very expensive like just to to work with it just because of all of that you need that good data and um, management the software is expensive the computer needs to be expensive the person is expensive so it becomes very expensive to do but it will get you all of this on this side and the advantages so I think that kind of covers that so in terms of the, putting it in environmental situations um, so if you have flooding happening in a, a region and that's a disaster that you're trying to get an image of there's usually clouds so it's nice to be able to see through that um, and then also being able to handle all weather is also helpful so I, it will save you a trip out so what if for example somebody something happens during a storm like you end up with a leak out of a tailings pond or a leak out of a um, out of a pipeline the pipeline breaks it, you can use microwaves to be able to detect changes that are happening at that at that time and it will be able to visualize it for you so the next objective is explain the transmission characteristics of radar signals so this is um, getting into some of the fun pirate talk as I call it <laughs> because there's a lot of R's in there <laughs> so there are several different types of microwave imaging uh, types out there. The original one was real aperture radar. It's also known as a brute force system, but it's way more fun to call it RAR. <laughs> so it is the original radar system and the spatial resolution is tied to the antenna length. There's an inverse relationship to it. So when the larger the antenna length, the smaller the pixels. So that meant that the spatial resolution improved. Well, if you can imagine, the further away you went, the bigger that antenna would have to be. So you're out, you go, you're flying a satellite. In order to use a satellite, your antenna is like 30, 40, 60 meters long. So in order to reduce that down, we needed to find a way to overcome that. So we don't have this great big antenna just so that we can capture the, the RAR data. So we moved to something called a synthetic aperture radar, which is SAR. Now SAR is what we use today. Um, it's used all a lot. There's a lot of conferences and webinars and everything else out there with SAR data. So SAR can, I say that it's satellite based, but you can also use it on airplanes as well. Um, and now we use a digital antenna. So it actually inversed that this equation up here. So now the spatial resolution is directly tied to the antenna length. So the shorter the antenna length, the physical antenna length, the better the spatial resolution. But there's a digital antenna that we can make infinitely long. And so that is what how those two trade off. So we have this digital antenna that we don't actually see, and it's a virtual one. And then we have our the physical antenna. So the physical antenna itself, the smaller it gets. Now, why wouldn't you want to have an antenna that's like a millimeter big? Because then now you you know you have super good resolution with a SAR. Well, the problem is is with a really small antenna, the wavelengths that we're looking at are like centimeter level. Um, like five centimeters, 10 centimeters. So if you don't have that antenna length long enough, it's not going to capture any data. It's going to like completely miss it and not be able to access it. So it's a big trade-off between the two. But they are very efficient now at how, how they did design them. So we have RAR, we have SAR, and then now we have side-looking airborne, airborne radar. And notice that there's radar, another R there. So on the side looking airborne radar, it's basically a SAR system that is on the airplane and it looks to the side at an angle. So the, the SLAR is on airborne specifically. So, and these were on the side here, there's some pictures. So this is a RAR system, this is from a SAR system, and this is from a SLAR system. Then we can get into how things are processed. So one of them is polarimetric synthetic aperture radar, and so pulsar. So this looks at how things are polarized. So there's two ways that um, energy can be polarized based on the electromagnetic theory. One is horizontally, and the other one is vertically. So you can 
visually think of that. So you can think of an inchworm moving its way along, and that would be a vertical, um, a, a vertical polarization. Or you can think of a snake, which is moving along, and that one would be more horizontal. So the first letter in any kind of polarimetry is always the transmitted orientation. So I might send something in one direction, and then I'm going to receive it in this, the other direction, and that's the second letter. So, um, so for example, HV sends a horizontal wave and receives a vertical wave. So we also have some good terms for them. So if we're sending and receiving in the same orientation, it is known as like pole. If we are sending and receiving in different orientations, it is cross-pull. And then we have du dual-pull, which is two polarizations, like or cross-pull. And then we have quad-pull, it's all four. So HH means send, or yes, transmit horizontal and receive horizontal. VV means transmit vertical, receive vertical. Then we have transmit horizontal, receive vertical, and then transmit vertical, receive horizontal. And there's more. <laughs> there's lots of these. So the next one is interferometric synthetic aperture radar. So this is using something called interferometry. This is what creates a digital elevation model for us. And that we can use, what, how it does it is if we use two images at two different locations, and we look at phase differencing between them. So, and that provides us with, um, with a, a DEM with elevation differences. We also have differential interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which is DINSAR. And now we're taking two interferometric or an interferometric and a, a single image, and we start detecting change with them. So we try to find how much has something moved. So interferometry and DIN, so DIN, INSAR and DINSAR, both of them are numerical in what kind of result we're trying to get because we're trying to say how much change has happened, how much did it move, and the, or what is the elevation. So elevation is an INSAR, how much has it changed or moved is DINSAR. Then the last one is combining it all together is polarimetric interferometric synthetic aperture radar, which is POLINSAR. This is used a lot in forestry more commonly. Um, what it does is it classifies at the same time as measures. So we can say, this is how big my tree is, and this is the type of tree it is. So here's some examples of them, some pretty pictures. So here's interferometry. Here is, uh, so this is INSAR, this is DINSAR. So it's showing shifts along uh, some faults. And this is Polinsar, so we have different classifications and different heights as we go. You can see all, all of that showing up there. So the, fifth, the third objective is describe the Earth's surface feature characteristics that influence radar returns. So there's a lot of scattering properties that do kind of are different with radar and, and with, with microwaves. So what that is, is, for example, radar smooth is one topic. So the object itself has a very smooth surface, and we call that spectral scattering, what that happens. And what that means is that all of the energy that comes from the sensor is going to come down at a very particular angle, and then it is going to entirely reflect away at the exact same angle, at like the, the opposite way. So you can see how this is coming down. If I drew a line down the center here, this is going to be this angle in here, and this angle in here are going to be the same, and therefore we don't actually ever see that data because the, the satellite would be coming at you from the from the screen. So we would never see that data. That's often what happens in very calm water. Then we have radar rough, which is where we have scattering in all sorts of directions, like here, and that's known as diffuse scattering. So that's um, the Radar rough means that I'm going to get some data back at my sensor. Then we have something called volumetric scattering, which is when something enters into an object and bounces around all over and then will reflect out, or not reflect out, but scatter out of the object so I can actually see what's going on. This would happen, for example, in snowpacks, within trees, that kind of thing. The last but not least, there is a double bounce. And what double bounces is that we have a 90 degree surface 
And so it reflects twice because it reflects off one surface and reflects off the next and then comes back to the sensor. And that is a double bounce. And we use that for, for looking at control points on the ground. Then we can look at image interpretation. So what are we actually seeing? So one of the noise issues that we have is that we have interference. So constructive interference means that we add all of the, the, the waves together and it makes it very a very, very bright pixel. And then we have destructive interference, which added all together makes a really dark pixel. And because it's microwaves, it can interference is like high all over the place. <laughs> it happens all the time. So we need to filter that. So that's one of the things that happens in our image interpretation. And we have to be really cautious when we're looking at it. Um, moisture is uh, the next problem because more moisture means more surface scattering. So if we think, okay, we got water in our soil, it's going to have surface scattering. If we have less moisture, it means it's going to go deeper and deeper. So looking at sand versus a, like a marsh, the sand is going to have a lot more penetration. We're going to see a lot more volumetric scattering than we would in a marsh where we're going to see a lot more surface scattering. And so moisture is, is also referred to with respect to the dielectric constant and so how well that material kind of, not so much conducts, but uses that uh, electrical energy. Whoops, sorry. Last but not least, we've already talked about roughness. So we're looking for spectral scattering and diffuse scattering, which is our radar smooth and radar rough uh, objects. Then we have to be cautious of geometric errors. So I'm going to get into the geometry next here. But when we're dealing with our images, we know that there's going to be some sort of distortion that happens because we're looking at the side. So and these three types of geometric errors are the most common. So for example, the, with radar shadows, when the energy can't, it happens when the energy can't actually reach something. So I'm looking here, and it, even if it hit the top of this, this mountain here, and it came down this whole region, if I looked from the top, is going to be black because you just can't see. It, it, the energy can't penetrate onto the other side of that, that hill. If we have radar layover, what happens is that we get the signals back in the wrong order. So if I send out, so I have A, B, and C in my center, and I'm going to send it out. So this is my rings. So here's an energy pulse, here's an energy pulse, here's an energy pulse. Then it's going to hit and say B. Well, what happens is that it comes back and it's expecting A. So it thinks that B, which is here, is actually A. And and then that causes it confusion because now it's going to keep coming down. It's going to hit A and then it's going to come up and then we have C. So these two are mixed up because this one's just too, is closer in the center of the, the, the beam. So that ends up making it look like the, the mountain's leaning over and leaning towards you. Then we have foreshortening and that's where everything kind of gets squished together. <laughs> so we have our, our pulses that come down, but what happens is that we hit A and B really close to the same time, and then C is really far out. So then you end up with really, really short signals together. So it says, oh, A and B are almost next to each other. So this hill that would have been would have looked like it was maybe like this one, it now has a really short edge here, so it'd be like A to B here, and then it's like really flat to C. So Radar foreshortening is another thing that we have to correct later. So then going into taking those errors, we have to we can get into explaining the geometric characteristics of SLAR imagery. So we're looking to the side, we're going along, and um, what does that mean? We have a whole bunch of terminology that we need to know. So I want you to think that this satellite is coming out of the, the screen at you. And down the center line of its beam, we're going to see a slant range. That's what it's called. On the ground, we have ground range. And the ground range is the area that, that the whole beam kind of illuminates as it comes down. And it's a pulse, actually. I should be using the word pulse instead of beam. The one that's closest to the satellite is known as a near range. The one that's furthest from the satellite is known as the far range. If we want to go straight down 90 degrees to the ground, 
that is known as the nadir. And then we have the horizon, which is going at a 90 degree angle to the nadir. So if we want to look at it in terms of angles, we have from the horizon down to the slant range that is known as a depression angle. And from the nadir to the slant range, uh, this is all at the satellite, is known as a look angle. And then there is an incident angle that goes from the 90 degree um, perpendicular line to the ground. And the slant range is the it, to the slant range. So the incidence angle is from the the perpendicular to the ground to the slant range. So that is the terminology that you're going to see with microwaves when you're talking about where it is and if you wanted to download any of the data, it's going to say, oh, the look angle is this, oh, the slant range is this, the near range is located here, the far range is located here, and the scale of these is this. So you're, that is how you, what you would have to know if you're going to be downloading or acquiring the images. Then we look at the ground. So this is actually like what is on the ground. So the satellite's moving along and it's, let's say, coming towards, towards us and it sends down a pulse, it's going to illuminate the ground. So we refer to the distance along, that's along the direction of the flight of the satellite as azimuth. And then we refer to the range as the range. So we have near range, which is closest to the satellite, far range, which is the furthest away. This is what it's going to look like on the ground. So we'll have several pixels all the way along. And every pixel, every pixel ha is, would look like this, or if you wanted to condense them, they look the same. The, the words azimuth and range are the same. But the swath width is how many pixels along the way that we are acquiring. So it, it would, if you have four, for example, if we had four across here, the the range along this side would be different, right? Because it's going to cover different um, areas on the ground. The azimuths are all going to be the same going down that direction. So swath width is how many pixels across on the ground. Range and azimuth are the width of the individual pixels and the azimuth, but you can add the ranges together. Or, and then the azimuths as well, and you get an image at the end. So that's how the geometry works for this. So that's a really quick introduction to what remote sen or microwave remote sensing is. I talked about just the basic elements of what, what's included about microwaves, including the, um, the wavelengths and how to interpret it a little bit. And I also talked about a little bit about the geometry of the microwaves. So that is, um, that's kind of a summary of what I have done here. So here's my references. And I look forward to seeing you in the next module.